On this episode, we're gonna be teaching you how to get big dogs like Ernie the St. Bernard out of the way of the shot. Ernie, here. By this. Come here, buddy. Place. Good boy. Uh, I'm just kidding, but what's up, guys? Um, on this episode, we're, we're gonna be covering a lot of things. Double episode, episode 10 and 11, I believe. Everything from fear aggression, remote collar recall, remote collar corrections, um, uh, place, duration works, anxiety, a variety of different types of anxiety. What else do we have here? Leash aggression, and a whole lot more on DBQ Tuesday. What's up, this is Blake Rodriguez and this is episode 10 and 11 of Dog Behavior Question Tuesday. Um, so we missed last week, uh, super, super busy, really, really busy this week as well, but uh, I wanted to make sure to get all these answered for you. Um, we have a lot of questions, about like 16 questions. I'm gonna try and pair some because I'm looking at them now and I see that a lot of them are very similar, so we're gonna try and get through this for you guys. Um, okay, I will start. I'll start on, on, on the back and just move our way up. So Ms. Airy, um, hey, I'm having trouble transitioning my pit to use the bathroom outside. What can I do to get him to go? And how often should three month old dogs be taken out to pee or poop? Um, let me see what we have here. You wanna, you wanna go get that real quick? All right. I'm also gonna put my phone on airplane mode that way that's how we, that's how we record. Um, and you're also gonna see some real, real stuff right here as well. So, nope. Sit. Oh, I'm recording right now. Sit down. So just to fill you guys in, literally in between, um, in between the beginning part before the intro and now, there was actually a little incident with one of our new boarding trains. So this is gonna tie into one of the questions a little bit later on, but I actually just got bit. So you'll notice the difference between the little Band-Aid. Uh, it's not, not a huge, huge thing, but it is, it is pretty deep. Um, would require stitches probably if it wasn't a dog bite, but just to kind of to kind of show you that this stuff really does go on. I know there's one question here that asks if we take biting dogs. Most of the dogs here are biting dogs. So um, to kind of sum that up really quickly, um, anytime you get bit as a handler or a trainer, in my mind, there's something that could have been done different. In my eyes, we kind of gave him a little bit too much freedom and didn't have him set up for success. I didn't have a leash on him. I didn't have um, a remote collar to kind of help me out with some things with communication. He's not at the point where we're remote collar training him just yet. Um, I have him on one now, which I'm gonna do some work. I had to go downstairs, correct it, put myself in a position where I could win that battle and then walk him through some exercises and stuff. So um, things do happen. We're not perfect here. Um, it's an operator error on my end and, and I just wanna kind of start by saying that. So um, I, I'll, I'll send the pictures to Andrew so you can see some of them. You can see what it looks like. Okay, let's go into Airy though. So you're having trouble transitioning your pit to use the bathroom outside. What can you do to get him to go and how often should three month old be taken out? Okay, so we do have a three month old here for a boarding train, uh, Willie. If you're following our Instagram and our Facebook page, you see all the updates. Um, we started getting him out like every hour and a half and I know that sucks to hear, but really there's a couple things that you're trying to build. One, you started him on wee, -wee pads most likely and that was a little bit I don't wanna say an error, uh, it's not the end of the world, but, but it does set you back a bit. Um, so what we do is we make sure he's getting his water, we make sure he's um, drinking and playing, because we know the more he's doing that, the better shot I have when I take him outside for him to go to pee. Now he's at a, at a point, wait, what'd you say? He's, he's going like four hours? Uh, yeah, Willie? Uh, about four hours um, before we can take him out again um, and, and just building that up. Uh, so the one thing I'm gonna go ahead and say is that you're probably not doing crate train your dog. You wanna limit the dog's freedom um, 
in the beginning so that they can't make options. Like if I had a dog that wasn't potty trained and I gave him this whole room, he's gonna go to the bathroom there and then he's gonna rest over here. So what you want is a crate that's probably the size of, you know, almost like one of these dogs, you know, for the placemats, give or take more or less, um, where the crate is that size. They have room to drink water, they have room to lay down, and um, when you get them out, they go straight outside. So you're eliminating options A through Z because A through Z are a bunch of wrong opportunities and errors and answers, and you're making it very simple, A and B, right and wrong. Inside the crate, outside, right? So the reason we're getting him out so much in the beginning is because we want to set a pattern of trust where he understands, while wow, these guys are always taking me out and I do spend a lot of time in my crate, I might make a couple of mistakes in the crate, but it makes more sense for me to go outside and I have a reason to hold it because when I feel like I might have to go, I know these guys are always getting me out. So it's kind of a two-part process. You have to have your dog that trusts that you're gonna get them out because they've learned that pattern. They have to spend time in the crate and then you also have to make it very, very clear A and B. Do not give them an entire kitchen. Do not give them an entire pen or living room area with a gate that's too much space, that's too much room, right? If I'm a car thief, I'm not gonna steer, steer, uh, steal cars here. I'm gonna go to New Jersey to steal cars, right? Because it doesn't make sense. I'm gonna get caught easy. I don't wanna do dirt in the area that I live. Your dogs don't wanna soil themselves in their crates. Um, Willie's been here for three weeks now. He's literally only made two mistakes. Um, and I, I mean, that's as good as it gets. So in the beginning, it actually meant us carrying him outside, bringing him over, boom, walking him, letting him, being good time managers, knowing, okay, he's been drinking this water, we gotta get him out. Because when they're that young, they don't really have the muscles to hold it. So you gotta be on your game. And it's hard for people in New York City. That's why like a New York City dog owner, you're either gonna be great or you're gonna suck. Um, especially when you're raising a puppy because you have to put a lot of time in it. And that's the only reason why I haven't gotten our second dog yet is because I'm so busy and I know that I want to do it right, you know? So, um, so hopefully that answers your question. Crate training your dog. Your dog should be sleeping in the crate. Your dog needs to learn how to do these things so they have a reason to hold it. Um, what are we going into? John B, my Boston Terrier has issues with on-leash on -leash aggression. We have been attacked many times by dogs running out of someone's house that these days, anytime he sees a dog, he gets very excited and if close enough, will attack them. This only happens when my wife or myself are walking him. Is there any way to get him to not do this and be friendly when approaching other dogs? Yeah, um, actually, let me take this out because I don't want the recording to stop. Let's see if we're still recording. We are still recording, okay, great. Um, Hmm, let's see here, dealing with on-leash aggression. This is a trust, trust issue, insecurity issue. The person who's steering is not being fully trusted. I've answered this um, on a few episodes before, more or less, but the first thing that you wanna be able to do is you gotta look at your tools that you're using. Are you set up with the tools to help make the message that you're trying to get across clear, right? Um, so what are you walking your dog on? What's your dog walk like prior to seeing dogs? Your version of the walk is good might be very different from our version of the walk is good. Is your dog leading in front of you? Is your dog responding to leash pressure? Are you able to control the senses of nose, eyes, ears and have the rest of the body follow? So usually I'm telling my clients, um, guide the head. That's why we like to walk dogs on, on collars, specifically prong collars, because we can be really soft and the, the pressure that they feel could be evenly distributed rather than a flat collar that can choke them. Um, you want to make sure that they respond to that. That's very smooth. That's very fluent because essentially when you're going to jump into any type of correction, which you're going to need to do at some point, you have to make sure that your recall is somewhat solid. Then now that might not mean off leash recall. That might mean the basics of on leash recall. When a dog is doing something and they feel this pressure, they know to come off of that and come over this way. If you have a dog that is if you have a dog that is feeling uh, that pressure, but choosing to put their butt toward it, right? So I'll give you a quick example. Um, I'm the dog and I'm looking to try to attack the dog over here. I feel pressure. What I should do is turn this way. So that means that leash pressure has to help me and show me where to go rather than pull me back. But if I have a dog that the second I do this with the leash, instead of going this way, they choose, you paying attention, Andrew, because I'm moving. Andrew? Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, they choose to do this and put their butt toward you. 
pardon my French, but they're basically giving you the middle finger or they're flipping you off and they're saying, I understand what you're telling me, but right now, you're not as important as this. So you need to master that and get that stuff really good. Make sure the walk is really solid. Make sure it's calm and relaxing. That way when you do use, uh, you do raise your voice and that's using the leash um, a, a little bit st uh, more properly and stern, you have a dog that knows, oh wow, paying attention to you is more important. So in order to do that softly, you have to do foundation work inside the house, add more structure everywhere else because rather than jumping right into the test, you do want to study. So that means what's, what's going on inside the house? Are you placing your dog? Are you asking your dog to do things that actually challenges them? If they happen to be good in the house, challenge them more. Find things that they aren't, are not good with and challenge them with that, right? Doing things like this is going to put you in a position where your dog knows that he must and it actually pays and it's worth it for him to, to take direction from you. You also work your dog through food. These are all like the little things that are indirectly related, right? So once you get that uh, accomplished, there's a couple things you wanna look for. You wanna find someone in your area that maybe offers some type of pack socialization exercises. Before you even get to that, you need to have a dog that can walk, not necessarily by in close proximity, but can walk through the neighborhood, hear dogs, and not freak out, not get growly, not do all of those things, right? So it's a combination of having a dog trust that they can take direction from you, and also letting your dog know what's up and correcting appropriately. Before you correct, the dog has to understand that language, right? Um, let's see what else. We're gonna go for high fives for canines. You guys are killing me here. You got like, uh, it's, not, it's not even you, it's, it's more catty too fast. You guys just uh, answer, asking all these different questions. Although, uh, high fives, I'm gonna cut you a little slack. I see that uh, you're just rephrasing it. So this does tie into um, uh, Ania or Ania. How do I stop fear aggression? Uh, originally, high fives for canines said that they had the same question. And then I'm just gonna go to the, to the last one that you asked. And we're gonna jump into this now. So, uh, can't wait for the big episode. Could I modify my question from last week? And nope, place, down. Um, my mixed breed puppy will actually not meet strained dogs on leash without getting too excited and anxious, which becomes aggression. The funny thing is that I can bring him, I, I can bring the same strange dogs to her when they are, I'm gonna go ahead and assume that's off leash um, and, and she trusts us and has a good meeting as I'm in control. This is a little um, confusing. One of those meant to say off leash because they both said on leash. Uh, I'm gonna go back to the other questions and check this out. The funny thing, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't want to take her to a dog park anymore, not because she isn't friendly, but because she can follow her own impulses to run over to dogs. But while on leash, she gets frustrated and anxious without being able to make her own choice while being restrained. Um, okay. So I'm pretty sure I was right. She's, she's more frustrated when on leash, but is okay when off leash. Um, is there any tips that you have for this type of leash reactivity? Um, and how can I keep her anxiety levels lower? Uh, we have been working on her recalls in situations where she becomes fixated. Thanks for always helping out. So you're already ahead of the game because you've been working on recall. That kind of ties into the last question. A couple things that I'm gonna go ahead and say, very similar to the last thing. You need to get to a point where from greater distances, your dog isn't concerning. A lot of people are under the impression that like the dog is fine when the dog is doing this. And the dog is kind of looking around and walking fine. They go, oh, there's a dog, but because they're not growling yet or lunging or acting a certain way, that that's okay. I'm gonna go ahead and say that I disagree with that. If your dog is walking fine and all of a sudden they see a dog and they're doing this, that's a degree of stress, that's a degree of anxiety whether that anxiety is going to lead into aggression or that anxiety is going to lead into excitement because they want to play, it still needs to be addressed because you have a dog that's changing purely off of sight, smell, or ears, which are the three main impulses that we need to get control over. Um, you want a dog to be able to see a dog and not be a big deal, no different than I love to be around people, but when I'm walking with my wife and I see other people, I don't, I don't lose my mind, right? Um, same thing with children. They play in the playground with other kids, when they're holding their hand, their mother's hand, and they're walking to school, and they see another kid, they don't absolutely lose it, right? Um, so you need to get to that point. On leash aggression, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and this is a, a random number here, I'm gonna say nine times out of 10 is directly related to the, the person on the other end of the leash. Doesn't mean you're a horrible person, doesn't mean you abuse the dog or anything like that, obviously. Um, well, not obviously, because I'm, I'm saying it, some people will, will make up stories, but, um, 
It just means that there's more that we can do and there's probably little things that you can catch that you're not realizing are associated um, or are related, right? Um, so what we need to do, if you really wanna get good with this, before you even go into like pack socialization where you're getting to the off-leash point, I would go ahead and say that walking, getting your walk solid by yourself, and then finding some friends or people that have the same interest to actually walk with you, where when you're on the leash walking, like Andrew, my, my, my brother might be here walking his dog who my dog wants to attack, and he's in control and I'm in control, and it's about what we're doing, which is moving forward. So we're moving forward, and it's not about them smelling or seeing whether they like each other. It actually has nothing to do with it. It has to do with the job that we're asking them to do, which is migrate and move forward with the pack. So what happens is they start working as a unit because they've been working together. The initial intro interest or impulse to see what the dog is about goes away. So your dog learns in, in, in a slower fashion to realize that they can see dogs and it's not a big deal versus always seeing dogs and it being an explosion, always seeing dogs and you having to walk away, always seeing dogs and if they're off leash, they'll run around and play. So it's always this level of excitement, whether it turns good or it turns bad, it's the same thing. So we have to get a dog to the point where they're around dogs and it doesn't matter. Impulse control in the house, walking, go for pack walks, go for long walks, just keep the dogs moving, make sure you can control that head and start to get the dog to the point where it doesn't matter if they see another dog. Don't go, oh look, it's a dog and let's see if you like each other. We wanna socialize your dog more. You're just driving the dog up more. I'm not saying that you're doing that, but I know a lot of people are. So um, hopefully that helps. Uh, Ania, fear aggression in general, I'm gonna go ahead and just in case you're referring, because it wasn't a very specific question, um, to, if it's a short question like this, how do I stop fear aggression? I have to give a short answer and say you have to get the dog to trust you more, but obviously I wanna help you out and I wanna go more into detail. So let's flip the script and assume that you're talking about humans. Um, it's kind of the same thing. So I, I would suggest some counter conditioning stuff where your dog is learning to eat from you, learning to eat from your hands, and once that gets really good and you're using markers, which we have covered in other episodes, uh, I believe the last episode, Andrew um, got hands-on with Samson and showed um, how we're using our markers. Get the dogs used to eating from your hands um, pretty much always and abandon the food bowl, abandon treats, and have the dog used to earning and working. Then what you can start to do is as that gets better, fade out you being the one that feeds and start working with a friend of yours that is the one that feeds. If your dog opts out of eating, then what are you gonna do, right? The dog doesn't eat. And then this is the only way the dog eats. So a couple things for safety if your dog is really, really fear aggressive is you can back tie the dog, put the dog on a leash and tie it to something secure, know where there's a mark, and then you can start with that person tossing their food. Now I'm not talking about treats, I'm talking about this is how the dog eats their meal. They're either gonna choose not to, and then they're gonna come back to it later where they're gonna be more hungry, right? Um, you're not depriving your dog of food, but you're showing them this is how we eat, right? So it's, it's kind of like my, my, my mother or my grandparents early on, it's like, listen, I'm cooking dinner for me, you have to eat at the dinner table. Like you wanna try and eat over there, you're not eating over there, so it's your choice. If you don't wanna eat, that's cool, go ahead, go hang out in the living room, play video games, but if you wanna eat, come to the dinner table, right? So you're, you're not depriving, you're just making the option very clear. Eventually the dog will come around, now, a couple of little things that, are, that you can do advance once you get to a certain point is when the dog is taking food or the dog uh, begins to get a little bit curious, you don't want that stranger to the dog getting all, here you go, and all this, and I've owned 10 dogs, I know how to do this. You want that person really not caring, watching TV, and if the dog has a drive and motivation and is hungry and wants food, you can, after that dog has been placed for a while and your friend has come over and the dog has gotten over the initial anxiety of somebody coming into the house, you can have them have food and have their hands out over here and just have them watching TV when the dog can come over and maybe smell. Smelling, you wanna have good recall for this, might be the, the initial handshake and the initial step where you might good boy or good girl and then you recall the dog off. So if that means on a leash, Good boy, come on over, good job, boom, and you give food, that could be a first step. It depends on, on where the dog is, right? If the dog is a little bit further along, the dog can come and take the food. Don't have that stranger go and reach. Just because a dog takes food doesn't mean it's okay. The dog takes food, right? And maybe with a hand, depending on where you are, it's a little bit of a finger brush, and then you call the dog off again. That might be a remote collar recall, that might be a remote and leash. Good job, reward, and this is how the dog eats. Eventually, 
you push to the point where you can pet food and the, the stranger can start to get involved, right? So there's a lot of things. Um, you want to make sure you have other things in, in place first. Uh, caddy too fast. I'm going to try and, and go through your, your 10 questions, but, but ask one next time, okay? Um, okay. Not a biggie, but my nine months old. Let, let's start from the beginning. When on e-collar and a dog leaves place, what corrections would you implement? When my nine-month-old pit mix was learning the command on leash, I would just walk her back. Now, three weeks later, she knows the command and wonder what is the level of correction here. Do I dial up on the e-collar or just use the working level correction? Um, that is a great, great question. I think there are a lot of different variables and it all depends on where you are with the dog and what type of dog you're dealing with. Ultimately, you do need to start asking more. So there are a couple of little tricks to the trade. Um, before I ever dial up with any remote collar, I make sure that a dog is on leash and I can show them what to do when their feeling levels slowly raise up, assuming that you're using constant pressure. You don't want to get in the habit of like popping on high levels and correcting because it's just going to create confusion. But if your dog knows the command and it seems like you've been really fair teaching it, they just don't know how to stay, you need to be a little bit more firm. You don't have to be mean, but you have to mean what you say. That's a, that's a very powerful quote right there. You don't have to be mean, but you have to mean what you say. So on leash, if I can guide the dog on, if the dog breaks, I like to pick up that leash. Um, first off, I like to apply my spatial pressure where the dog knows how to respond to that. If the dog is not, I'm walking over with spatial pressure to grab the leash, give a little bit from the side of a pot to create, whoa, that's different. This person means something, I gotta pay attention. Guide the dog over, right? That might be with remote collar pressure on, on a low level. Um, or slowly dialing up as I'm going on. The button comes off when the dog gets on, on the uh, placemat. And then what I might do, if you can give a little, bit of, a, a little bit of a pop to put the dog into a down, you can pair that with a remote. And it might trigger a dog, depending on where you are in the relationship, to go, whoa, that's different. Let me actually try staying here because you seem like you mean business. So you want to you wanna take your relationship from being the substitute teacher where where the, the kid or the dog kind of listens to actually being a teacher where they know the difference between a teacher and a substitute. And I don't know what it was like for you guys unless you're really goody, two, goody two-shoes, but anytime I was in elementary school or junior high school or college and a sub came in, we knew it was, it was a, a joke of, of a class or, or, or whatever it was, and we didn't really have to take it seriously. So um, you gotta choose, and no offense to any of you guys that might be substitute teachers, but you, you gotta know what, what I mean when I say that. Um, Next question is going to be, any good focus um, on handler exercises? I love when uh, you, when come, so I'm going to assume you love when the dogs, when we apply the here command or, or the come command, and the dogs come up and stare straight into our face. Um, yes, actually, last episode, Andrew did a demonstration um, with Samson with eye contact exercises, so that was episode nine. Go back to episode nine and watch that, because I think that's really going to help you, okay? Um... And that's that for that. Awesome. White M. Tiger. Hi, my dog just won't stop going crazy around people, so we can't bring him anywhere. What can we do to help him? P.S. He's an English setter mix with Lulin, if that helps anything. Okay, so English setter, um, hunting dog, pheasant hunter, I believe. Um, <laughs> pheasant hunter, I believe. Um, Andrew's making faces behind the camera. I'm gonna go ahead and say that your dog needs to practice impulse control and has to start more in your house. Um, before you jump on taking him anywhere and expecting your dog to behave, let's be honest with ourselves, how's our dog behaving inside? Like, don't, and this goes into the beginning, uh, the first question that I answered, don't assume that just because your dog happens to behave, and your dog might not be behaving, but let's assume that your dog is, that your dog is gonna to happen to behave outside. If you're telling your dog to behave and you're showing your dog where to lay, where to do this, what to do when you get up to go to the bathroom, what to do when you hug your husband or you hug your wife, um, not to be involved, not being the center of attention, having your dog not charge when you drop uh, the avocado from your sandwich, he just comes in and scoops and eats it, not having your dog chilling and all of a sudden the nose picks up and it's right on your coffee table smelling, all of those little things are opportunity for you to practice impulse control. All distractions in the world well, most of them, with the, with the exception of like taste and, um, and touch, is going to be nose, eyes, ears. So you need to start controlling impulse control or teaching your dog that they have impulse control of nose, eyes, ears. You have to start doing duration place work exercises, teaching your dog to chill out, teaching your dog not to 
um, get overly excited when uh, people come to the door, when you guys come to the door. That's all opportunity. If you can't master it there, you're not gonna master it when you're outside, right? Um, I realize that I do have one more question and this ties right into this for, for Caddy Too Fast, so sorry I missed this out. I just, um, your questions are popping up everywhere on this page. Um, not a biggie, but my nine month old pit mix, which is great on e-collar, prong, heel, and duration work gets way too excited in downstay and when people come over to pet her. So I always get her out of the command, which is good um, first, but with little kids, I think it would be beneficial if she stayed down so they can approach her on their terms. How do I work on that excitement so she doesn't break command? First thing I'm gonna say is she has to learn how to not break command and you have to learn how to advocate a little bit more and not let anybody and everybody that wants to pet your dog pet. Um, you have to ease into this slowly. Your dog has to be really rock, rock solid when kids and people and things are going around and they're not even trying to pay attention to the dog. They're living life around your dog and your dog has to learn how to not be over the top for that. Like actually try say, hey, nobody pet this dog. Let's see where they can get. When that's getting good, then what you want to do is you want people that you can actually coach, that you can actually help. Adults that are calm, that are going to take direction from you where they might sit, they might sit next to a hand, might come out. If the dog gets overly excited, you're there with a the leash to correct that, put the dog back into a down, start again nice and easy, so that any type of affection becomes calm, massage-like, nurturing affection, not affection that ruins, right? A lot of petting, a lot of affection, a lot of, oh my God, I wanna pet the dog, ruins the, the good behavior that we want. It's, not, it's kinda not fair to the dog. So when you do get to the point where you wanna start working with kids, you wanna get to a point where the dog isn't breaking command, but the people that are coming up aren't getting all crazy and going, hi, right? So there's a very big difference. I'm gonna try and do this really quickly here. There's a very, very big difference between me coming over and doing something like this, being calm and actually nurturing this guy and giving him some love. And you can see he's kind of like stretching out there and really getting him going versus, oh, oh my gosh, and going crazy, and you can see how easily these guys get worked up, right? So in this situation, nope, down. I would have a leash, right, down. What I would do is I would probably give a little bit of a pop, not anything frustrating, and then what I could do if I'm gonna go ahead and pet, it could be really, really soothing, and I can almost like hypnotize this dog, you see in this, into kind of this, oh, this kind of feels good mentality, right? Um, same thing with this guy. Right, I can do this, or I can get him, oh, what are you doing? And then it really works dogs up. You don't want to do that, and it's not fair to your dog if you're letting kids do that, but you're expecting good behavior. So forget calling your dog out of place. Um, what you should be doing is, is not allowing people to be in that position unless they're people that you're prepared for and, and are actually going to help you. Otherwise, they're just harming you. Um, so hopefully that helps. I keep checking to make sure we're recording because last episode it stopped a bunch of times. Uh, okay, let's see where we are now. So that was a white girl. Um, came out chow. My 10 month old has the worst anxiety around trucks, the train above ground and is inhibiting his wanting to walk. We used to walk around the park all over, can barely do that. How do I get him over the fear? He just lays down and won't move. Okay, pressure release exercises. If your dog is on the harness, get him the hell off the harness. Um, if your dog is on you know, something that's making it difficult for you to help, even if it's like a martingale or a slip lead, your dog will really resist and you're trying to do pressure release, your dog will choke versus on a prong collar they really can't and you can be soft and start to teach that and trust. A couple things that you can do is you can, um, if you do have a treadmill or water or something, you wanna get your dog to start functioning around this sound away where the volume is lower. So you can do treadmill work with a soundtrack very low, which is the same advice that I gave, I think two or three episodes around fireworks and thunder, talking about the volume and slowly raising that up. Get your dog to eat around it. If you have a dog that shuts down, you wanna teach them how to be in movement. If you have a dog that takes flight, you wanna teach them how to not shut down, but how to actually chill out and stay next to you. So in, in this case, your dog is shutting down. Pressure release needs to be good. You have to get that solid where the dog is not pressure releasing you and telling you to stop because odds are what you're doing is they freeze and then you shut pressure on the leash off and you say, hey, come on. And you're negotiating the dog is saying, hey, now right now I'm scared. So when that's happening, you need to be in a position to 
basically be the one that overrides what your dog is saying, but you need to teach the dog that they actually can override that sound. So also doing feeding exercises with soundtracks really, really help. Start really low and then slowly start to raise that up. Um, Miles the Lab, car ride anxiety. That's all you said. I, I asked um, if you could please provide us with a question a little more specific about that topic, but I'm just gonna kind of sum this up. I wanna be fair in case you are watching. Um, car ride anxiety usually ties in with the rest of anxiety. Um, there aren't many dogs that are actually car sick. Usually it's anxiety related. So if you can practice place, if you can practice downstairs, if you can practice your dog crating, your dog relaxing when they get into the car, do the same thing, make sure the AC is going so it's nice and cool. Um, you can help to get the dog over that usually. Uh, you don't want your dog kind of up and over here and doing this and going from window to window and saying, are you excited we're going to the park? Because you're just adding to that anxiety, all right? Um, answer high five canines. Lori, what are your thoughts on training dogs that have bitten people? I've heard other trainers say things like three bites is too many, um, almost in an attitude of don't train the dog, it's too late or not worth the effort. This approach or non-approach um, doesn't resonate with me, me either, me either. Um, what do you do when someone comes to you with a biter? Um, almost everybody comes to us with a biter. This dog bit me today, has bitten before. Um, this dog was lunging, biting people. This dog, did, did Maya bite? Uh, I, don't I don't remember, she had some high anxiety, was pulling. I'm not sure, yeah, she's bitten dogs. Um, she, she gets a little weird about them and, and snaps. Um, he was biting dogs. And he also pulled the grandmother's shoulder out of her socket um, on the walk. Maggie used to be nervous. Soko, cut that out. Uh, and then Remy. Remy's not really like a horrible dog, just a little insecure and plays a little too rough, so has bitten dogs also. Um, so yeah, most of the dogs that come here have, have bitten and stuff. Not to say that we don't work with puppies and dogs that are non-problematic, but um, usually if people are trying to train their dogs, it's not because they have a perfect dog and they're trying to get the dog better, it's because they're struggling with something. So unlike most people that will say, kick the dog out of a class or, or say, oh, this dog is too much, this and that, we, we invite you because that's what we do, right? Um, so anyone that's saying that, like, the only thing I could say is they're uncomfortable with their skill set or they know their skill set and they're saying, hey, that's not for me. For them to take that to the next level and say, oh, you shouldn't do it because like they can't, that's, that's a little bit of an ego thing. Um, some people are happy working with puppies. We have people in the area that um, are trainers also that, that just work with like pups and stuff and that's cool. Like they don't work with problem behaviors. And that's, that's kind of one of my biggest things for, I think that's the problem in the dog training industry is that dog training is no different than the field of being a doctor. There are many different fields of doctor, right? So I'm not gonna give advice on pediatrics when I'm an open heart surgeon. Right? Uh, I'm not gonna say you can't do that. So I, I think the problem with training is a lot of people don't know what field they're in. Some people teach dog tricks. Some people do scent detection. Some people do sport bite work. Some people do pr protection work. You know, some, so there's a lot of things like we do behavior modification primarily. Um, so there's just so much uh, and, and there's so many different things to learn and, and little ways to include a little bit in, of all of that together. But uh, in this situation, somebody that says you can't fix a dog that bites, that's how we made a name for ourselves. So, um, so that's, that's a bunch of baloney, for lack of a better word. Um, Kiri, I have a husky who tries to escape the yard a lot. And when he does, Soko, cut that out. My buddy, uh, Soko has a little bit of a skin irritation. He got a, a bath with the groomers and they used some type of conditioner that's really made his skin itchy. We gave him an oatmeal bath and some Benadryl, but uh, he keeps trying to go at it. I might put the cone on him right after this episode. Um, okay, sorry, I have a Husky who tries to escape the yard a lot, and when he does, he won't come back when called. He's really smart, but only listens when he wants to. How do I train him to listen all the time without bribing him with treats? That's a big one right there. Um, he's a year and a half, I got him a few months ago. I also wanted to train him to walk nicely on leash and leave cats alone. Um, okay, so you might be new to our show, I seriously, seriously, highly, highly suggest you start from episode one and go through all of those because you're gonna get a lot of information along with following our Instagram page, following our Facebook and our YouTube. You're gonna see a lot of things that are gonna help you. One thing I'm gonna go ahead and say, I'm gonna answer really, really quickly. Your dog has to be good with pressure release on the walk, um, not walking on a harness. Ideally, if your dog is struggling, I don't care what your dog walks on, if they walk fine, but if they're not, 
walking on a harness can be very, very difficult. Um, using treats, we use a lot of food and positive reinforcement. However, and I've said this in an episode before, we reward for good behavior. We don't bust out food in order to get good behavior. So there's a very, very big difference. As far as recall goes, once your pressure release is solid and you're able to get leash recall, you transfer that to remote collar recall. Now you have new age Bluetooth technology and invisible leash where you can use it to correct, you can use it to communicate, to whisper, and it's a communication device where you don't have anything attached but the remote. It's one of the best tools on the market one of the most misunderstood and probably overly abused second to food. I think food is probably the most abused dog training tool out there because it's easier to use um, for people um, while at the same time, the timing and everything, it it, it just, people mess it up all the time. So um, hopefully that answers your question. And lastly, Josh, um, when working with dogs with anxiety, how long does it take to cut through that until you see the dog just chill out. I'm working this six either month or six year boxer, tons of duration work, thresholds at heel, or thresholds and heel. His vocalization, like barking, whining, heavy panting when in place have gone way down in two or three days. He can hold a place like a champ, but I can tell he's not really letting go. Um, Do you have any suggestions or anything to uh, add to duration structure? Um, you prong and remote collar condition him mostly on recall and heel. Okay, so again, ahead of the game, awesome stuff. Make sure your dog is getting exercise, but don't over-exercise them physically to the point where you're turning them into an anxiety triathlon, triathlon athlete, right? A um, couple things you can do. I don't know if you remember her from our last episode. She was an anxious wreck, and you can see her right now really, really settling in. Um, it was really difficult for her. So there's a couple things a lot of working them for their food, a lot of place exercise, a lot of structured walks, a lot of these things, and then just chilling out when the dog is sleeping and away from you in a crate on a bark collar. Do not use, this is my opinion of course, um, um, citronella uh, bark collars. I think that's actually more inhumane um, because you have a spray that you'll smell for hours after the dog barked, corrected themselves, and it's just confusion. I mean, we can smell citronella for hours, a dog can smell it for who knows how long their noses are much more sensitive versus, um, versus stimulation where you have um, the dog that barks, feels something, goes, hmm, that's interesting, feels something, hmm, that's interesting. So the way that we do it is when we know our dog is anxious and they're in the crate, we'll put them in the crate on a bark collar on, what we use our Garmin, um, Garmin uh, Bark Limiter Deluxe, because you can recharge those and it has different levels. We'll give the dog 12 to 24 hours on level one, which is nothing. It's more of a correction base than a remote collar like level one, but at the same time, it's something for them to feel and go, what the heck, and bark through it and realize that when they do finally stop, that weird sensation stop, that's weird. After 12 to 24 hours, we track and monitor if they're still like barking through it or it's enough to kind of slow them down, we'll leave it on that. Um, The good thing about that collar is you can actually track progress when you shut it off. You can see how many times a dog barked in case you were away. Um, And what we're doing is we'll bump it up to the next level. It has seven levels, we'll bump it up to two. Give that 12 to 24 hours, three, 12 to 24 hours. And if your dog is already remote collar trained, what I would suggest is practice a lot of constant remote collar downs. Remote collar downs, when they feel pressure, they know downing relieves it, downing relieves it, downing relieves it. There's something about physically being in a down that will help a dog to relax more than when they're up pacing or going crazy. Because I I don't know what it is, it's like even even a human, when they get super frustrated, um, if you wake me up from, from bed, I can get frustrated while I'm in bed, but at some point when you finally wake me up, I explode, okay, fine, I'm up, what do you want me to do? I can't reach that level of frustration or anxiety if I'm laying down in bed, right? Um, So you're limited on how high you can go when you're laying down. I think dogs tend to realize when they're barking or they're whining or something, they go, you know what, this actually doesn't feel so bad. So instead of a dog barking through and stressing, I'd rather interrupt that so that they can kind of learn to chill. Another thing too, if you have a really, really anxious dog, don't let them rest anywhere else. If they're struggling in the crate or something, they only rest there. So they're working, doing a bunch of other stuff, getting the dog moving so that they learn how to maybe crate rest before you bring them out to place rest. Place rest might be easier after crate rest or vice versa. The variables always change from dog to dog, but um, it's kind of this circle of of trial and error and saying, oh, this dog's not ready for this. We should probably try this first. So keep at it. Looks like you're doing good. If you've seen things settle, fantastic. 
Um, I posted a video on our Facebook page about panting with an anxious dog with possessive issues for a tennis ball. The panting is actually good. Um, it's the difference from clenching in and whining and or barking to doing that initially anxiety might be but I'd rather have that um, as they start to settle make sure the dog has water chills out and uh, you should be all right buddy I think that is everything oh wait I can't be M Butera Butera I have a three-year-old lab terrier mix I adopted six months ago. We made a lot of progress on her behavior, but she still bites while playing and sometimes even tries to nip me when she wants to play or give attention. Any suggestions? Yeah, absolutely. Stop letting your dog run the house, right? What you need to start doing is giving your dog more structure. Your dog is three years old. It's not a puppy. Um, in fact, around like eight months is where we should, should have started treating it more like an adult. What you need to start doing is not letting your dog tell you when it needs to go to the bathroom, not letting your dog tell you like all those things. You should be such a responsible time manager that you're doing all these things for them. You're being a good host, right, to your guests essentially. They don't have to figure out and say, hey, uh, wh where should I be sitting? Or hey, um, what fork should I be using for the dinner table? Or hey, what should I, none of that. All they have to do is pay attention to you and you give them direction. You need to have more, better communication so that when you do get to correcting and interrupting, your dog was, knows what to do. You don't want to replace, when a dog is acting silly and they're, they're doing that and they're being inappropriate, you don't want to give them something to chew on. You want to address it, have them be calm, and then show them what they can do that with. So that way it doesn't go unaddressed, otherwise your dog's going to keep doing it forever, right? Um, addressing it is all based on what type of dog you have, what works for the dog, what's appropriate for the situation and the, and the state of mind. Um, that nipping and everything, for me, it has to be clear because these are things that, I mean, you probably won't do this, but these are things that actually gets dogs killed. Behaviors that actually aren't that serious. The dog is play nipping, getting silly, starting to get bratty, getting pushy, telling you when they want to play, telling you when they want to uh, rest. If you want to do something, it eventually transfers to possessive behavior where the dogs are like chilling and then you want to get it to go off for a walk and it's growling and telling you it doesn't want to do that. You're setting up a dog that's telling you who, what, where, when, and how, when we should actually be doing that because we live in this world. So we kind of got to backtrack. You got to give your dog more structure, more rules, more boundary, and start that all soft and slow so that when you get to a point where you say, hey, knock it off, your dog understands that. Right now, jumping into the correction might be a little bit tough, um, but you're, you're building the foundation blocks for a bratty dog that may or may not, and I'm going to lean more on the side of, of more likely to start um, really developing some nasty behavior problems if this continues, right? So um, hopefully that helps go through all the dog behavior question episodes. You're going to get a lot of good information out of that, okay? Guys, um, I know this is a long one. This is great. Oh, there's that video one, right? Yeah. Shoot. I got to watch that real quick. Do you remember? Did you, did you read it? Oh, you know what? I can... So why don't we just say you watch the video? Cut. All right, we're going to watch the video real quick. We have a... Um, a video uh, inquiry, and then I'm gonna answer that right after, so we're gonna cut this real quick. Hi guys, uh, this is Duchess. Uh, she is about three years old, uh, seven whole pounds, so she's just a teeny little girl. I just adopted her from rescue, and um, although she looks sweet and innocent, um, we do have a, a little bit of an attitude with her sometimes, uh, especially when it comes to jealousy with other dogs. I've been working with her on um, impulse control, on um, some of her other issues, aggression with toys and such, and I've seen marked improvement with that. Um, but when it comes to the jealousy with other dogs, I've been having a harder time breaking her of that. Um, if another dog uh, is near me or sitting with me, um, she starts by growling at them and then um, goes full-blown vicious. Um, if I try to get in the middle of it to break them up and separate them, um, I do get bit in the process. So I'm looking for um, some tips, some advice, uh, some guidance, some things I can do um, to help solve her of these vicious, vicious outbursts. Thanks, guys. Okay, so Jen with Dutch's, a um, couple things. First, first and foremost, like if your dog acts like that, all right, by the looks of things, it looks like you actually have a really soft, like sweet dog but you're letting it take advantage of you and, and dogs are very smart so they realize 
when they can get something, they're not going to want to let that go. So um, um, it seems like you're a little bit softer and you're letting your dog get away with a lot. For a dog to be acting like that, I can tell you right now in the video, maybe it was just the video, but I would assume that it's not. Stop letting your dog like all up here and do this. And when you're going to pet other dogs, your dog shouldn't even be here. If you're going to work on impulse control and you're starting to do that stuff, awesome, awesome, awesome. But you need to have a dog that can hold place, right? More importantly, not holding place naked. So have a leash on that dog. Have a long line on that dog. Um, make sure your dog can hold place when the food bowl is over here. Make sure your dog can hold place when you throw a toy, even if it's for nobody. Make sure your dog can hold place when you get up to go to the bathroom, open up your fridge, right? All of these things. If your dog is getting good with that, your dog should be able to hold a downstay or a place when you go to pet a dog. To be fair and to help the dog, make sure, or to help Duchess, make sure that, um, you're not going through the roof excited and you're starting calmly so the dog learns how to do that. Dog's making a mistake. Now you're not trying to grab your dog that's at risk of biting you. You grab the leash, you correct, bring the dog right back on and your dog learns how to do that. You might see a dog that's a little bit nervous and oh my gosh, I've never gotten that before. But yeah, of course your dog's nervous because now it's learned that it can do that with you and all of a sudden you're saying it can't. It's scared and it's saying, what should I be doing? But that's the start to a beautiful thing a dog that's actually asking you, what should I be doing instead? So when you have a dog that's getting possessive or getting jealous, basically all it is is possessive. You're being seen as an object um, that it wants to guard. You need to remove it from what makes it possessive. Um, so you gotta go away. No, I'm just kidding. What, what you need to do is the dog needs to be over here and not be around you so much because it hasn't earned that right. You know what I mean? Um, uh, it really hasn't earned it. So the dog needs to learn how to not be on top of you so much because that's the very thing that's hurting you in this situation. The dog is sweet until. The dog has to learn that it's not the center of attention. It can be very much involved in things, but it has to learn how to be involved. If my friends from the neighborhood, what I grew up in, want to get invited to uh, a, a fancy company party or something you know, with some of my higher end clients, they better learn how to act because if they don't know how to act, I'm not the person that invites them anyway because then that's just embarrassing. They're the ones that I can't do anything with, right? So if they want to come be invited, they have to learn. They have to train them. And I say, this is how you present yourself. This is how you have to dress. It's not a backwards fitted in this. We actually have to dress up for this event, right? You're going to a wedding. You're not wearing jeans. You're not doing this. Things like that. We prepare our friends. We prepare our family, our kids. You got to prepare your dog. So your dog has to learn to hold a place, do all those things, eventually get corrections, for that behavior, no different than I get a correction when I'm speeding on a highway, when I get pulled over by a trooper, I get a correction if I was to get caught robbing a bank. You know what I mean? Like, it, the excuse isn't, well, I, I was poor. You know, I grew up in poverty. I don't go, oh, you grew up in poverty? Well, it's okay. It doesn't matter. And the reason I bring that, that analogy up is because people will say, oh, well, it's a rescue. So maybe there was a history. History doesn't matter. If my history is that I was poor, it doesn't make it okay that I can go rob the bank across the street. Right? So it's the same thing. You need to get your dog over that. Forget excuses and teach your dog what's allowed and what's not allowed, point blank, period. The, the more you start to do that, eventually you're gonna get the dog over this hump where they start trusting you and they stop taking advantage of you. So hopefully that helps. Um, I know we've been contemplating um, doing a board and train with this dog, um, just following you know, some of the emails, whether it's with you or another owner. Um, uh, definitely happy to help because I know that this dog has a lot of potential. Hopefully it's with you, all right? I'll talk to you guys soon.